Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2022 CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice Symposium. My name is Rhonda Rosen. I'm programming an exhibitions librarian here at the Hannon Library. And I just want to welcome you all for this very unique, timely, and important discussion entitled Accessibility and Inclusivity on University Campuses academic libraries role in serving people with disabilities. I want you to know that this program will be recorded and will appear on the CSJ Center's YouTube page. And uh, Stephanie will be putting a link in chat for you all. Um, I would like to do a land acknowledgement before we start our program. This event has been organized in part through the Loyola Marymount University and the William H. Hannon Library. And so we use this location to base our land acknowledgement. The land that the William H. Hannon Library sits on is the unceded land of the Tongva peoples who in the face of ongoing settler colonialism continue to claim their place and act as steward of their ancestral lands as they have for the past 8,000 years. These lands and waters reach from the Pacific Ocean where we stand today, well into what is now San Bernardino County. The whole of the Los Angeles Basin is unceded territory. I would ask you all to also to take a moment and spend some time thinking about what it would mean to take responsibility for one's presence on stolen land. I also encourage you to learn more about the history of the land where you sit by going to native-land.ca. So today, the moderator of our program is Dr. Amanda Apgar, who is an assistant professor in our Women and Gender Studies Department here in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts. Amanda Apgar received her PhD in Gender Studies from the University of California, Los Angeles. Her book, The Disabled Child, from the University of Michigan Press, examines memoirs about raising children with disabilities and demonstrates the structural underpinnings of gender, class, and race privilege in positive per portrayals of disability. Dr. Apgar teaches on gender, sexuality, disability, body theory, memoir, and autism. So she is the perfect person to start off our program. Amanda, I will turn it off to you, turn it to you now. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be moderating the panel today. Um, this panel is part of the CSJ Symposium. Um, we're thinking about transforming justice into action. And in this panel, particularly, what academic libraries are doing to advocate and better serve the community of people with disabilities on our campuses. And how does the work that the library does with serving this community um, overall uh, forward the university's justice mission, mission and make accessibility more broadly available throughout the entire campus. So we're gonna talk a lot about accessibility at the library, including information resources, technology, um, accessibility from an economic perspective, collaboration and physical space. Um, I'm excited to be in conversation uh, with librarians and with Dr. Scheibler um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we'll go ahead and get um, under our conversation underway. Um, a couple of access notes before we do. There is um, closed captioning enabled. If you would like to have a subtitle, you can click on the bottom bar of your uh, Zoom screen, the CC button, show subtitle. Um, if at any time you have would like somebody to repeat something, feel free to drop a message in the Q&A. I will monitor that and we'll do what we can to make sure that we can address those questions in a timely manner. Um, and also at any time, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A for us to pull back around at the end of our talk. Um, and for visual access, I am a white woman with brown hair um, sitting in front of a Zoom screen that's a Full and colorful bookshelf. I'm wearing uh, pink glasses and I have a brownish greenish scarf on and um, I will be putting my mask back on when I'm not talking. I am not in a 
totally uh, isolated space and there might also be a little noise pollution. And if that happens, I apologize and feel free to flag me if you need me to repeat anything. Okay, so we are here with Darlene Aguilar. Darlene Aguilar is an instructional design librarian, a reference, she also works in reference and instruction services at William Hannon Library at LMU. Um, Darlene creates online library tutorials that improve student information literacy and research skills. Before transitioning to Loyola and Marymount, she worked in the LA Unified School District, providing educational workshops and resources to remove socioeconomic barriers to learning. And she's continuing this work at LMU. Her goal is to help increase the use of online instruction to accommodate working professionals who do not have the option to attend school solely in person. We are also joined by Marie Kennedy, a serials and electronic resource librarian, a uh, member of acquisitions in the collection, the acquisitions and collections department at William Hannon Library. Um, Marie is, uh, has written and presented widely on electronic resources, including co-authoring two editions of Marketing Your Library's Electronic Resources, a How to Do It manual. Marie writes the organization monkey blog about organization and librarianship um, and is the co-director of the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship. And I'm just dropping a link to the organization monkey blog in the chat. We're also going to be in conversation with Dr. Sue Scheibler, Chair and Associate Professor of Film, Television and Media Studies at LMU. Dr. Scheibler's research and teaching interests include film theory, television studies, video game studies, disability studies, queer pedagogy, disability justice, and inclusive pedagogy. And I am, as Rhonda said, Amanda Apgar, Assistant Professor in Women's and Gender Studies, a researcher and an activist in feminist disability studies, disability justice, and autism. Very excited. Okay, so. Um, why don't we begin with sort of thinking about uh, this question of the moment, right? Uh, when we first came together to plan what was gonna happen at this symposium, we began by thinking about this lesson we learned from folks with disabilities coming out of this, um, this extended period of remote learning, which was this, this question of like, well, what sorts of access did we achieve during the remote period that is ongoing, um, that we can preserve or carry into um, the hopefully post-pandemic world on the horizon, right? So folks with disabilities and access needs have for a very, very long time been advocating for flexibility in the workplace, remote options, um, a lot of the things that are really commonplace now. So the question is like, what sorts of things can we do to increase access broadly um, going forward? And to think about this question, um, I want to introduce just, uh, I have to set up a quick slide to share um, to think about access, accommodations, and um, disability justice as sort of like three different ways of talking about disability and talking about um, access on university campuses and beyond. Um, so we're all probably very familiar with accommodations. This is uh, the approach to um, to folks with disabilities, to supporting their individual needs for accessing classroom materials, um, supporting an individual's opportunity for an equitable learning environment and equitable learning opportunities. Access is a little bit different from the accommodations model because when we talk about access, we're talking about um, removing the barriers to uh, to it as broad inclusion as possible to begin with, right? And so, whereas accommodations is focused on the individual, access might mean something like including um, a screen readable PDFs for the whole class, right? Instead of creating and modifying curriculum for the student with a vision disability, all readings assigned for a class will be screen readable, right? So it's removing those barriers so that accommodations don't actually even need to be made in the first place. Disability justice is uh, 
an even richer approach to thinking about access because disability justice is about looking at how um, obstacles to inclusion also beyond just sensory, physical, and other types of impairment integrate with other social structures like racism, sexism, classism, um, language access, and all sorts of other ageism, sizeism, and all sorts of other mechanisms of oppression and segregation. So disability justice asks us to look beyond just um, the individual person's need or access in terms of sensory and physical and other types of impairment to actually the way these things work together to promote the inclusion and thriving for a subset of human body minds, but not all human body minds. So to give you like a little illustration, I have I found this image on the internet. I don't know who the original maker is um, and I'll describe it to you, but it's four uh, panels depicting the tree from the most heartbreaking of all children's books ever written by Shel Silverstein, The Giving Tree. <laughs> if you need some good tears, I highly recommend. Um, but so in these four pictures we have uh, or in four panels, we have inequality, equality, equity, and justice, and they're comparing. So in the first one, this picture is saying, this is a picture of inequality. There's a tree, it's like leaning to one side, and on that one side, it's really heavy with apples. And there's two little purple humans standing underneath the tree on either side. And the human that's underneath the apple heavy side has like a lot of options for apples, right? Cause they're all on that side, they're gonna fall on that side, but the little person without a lot of apples on their side doesn't have access to the apples, right? So the suggestion is this is a picture of inequality. They have unequal options here. So equality in the second panel is a picture of these two little humans, both on the exact same size um, ladder. So they have equal tools equally distributed to access the apple trees. This didn't change anything about how many apples are in the tree. And it didn't change anything about how the fact that the tree is still leaning over to one side. And so now that our friend has the ladder, they can pick more apples, but we haven't really done anything to address the needs of the other person. They have equal tools, but the results are not equal. And the third panel, we have equity, um, which, our friend on the one side of the tree has a taller ladder. So now they are actually able to reach the tree as well. So both of our friends have tools appropriate to their specific um, disabilities or their specific obstacles, right? That enable them the access to the tree. It's totally fair. They can both pick apples on the tree. It hasn't actually done anything to change the tree because it's still leaning and there's more apples on that one person's side. But in terms of accessing the tree, it's all there. Then there's this last panel, this picture of justice in which the tree has been adjusted, right? So you see that there's some boards set up and a, um, and a, oh gosh, what's the word for that thing? Like a tether. And these two items are working together to straighten the tree. And I guess we're operating under the presumption that maybe the tree as it was tilted was in like a deep shadow and that fruit wasn't able to ripen on that side. And once it's been structurally adjusted, then not only do we have equity, but we truly have achieved justice. And so this is kind of like where we're coming from when we think about disability justice. How can we change the structures that produce and sustain disability to begin with? And so that's, the, that's how I come to this conversation and my research and activist approach um, to what we're gonna be talking about today. So again, the, talk, the title of our um, talk today is Accessibility and Inclusivity on University Campuses, Academic Libraries Roles in, service, in Servicing People with Disabilities. Um, between us, we're gonna discuss the different ways students learn and the different ways faculty teach, different mechanisms that Hannon um, offers for access, different uh, structures of access at Hannon, and then we'll, also be discussing some collaboration opportunities that sort of yield through thinking about um, disability and access together. Okay, so why don't we begin then with a conversation with Sue and Darlene about 
this question of teaching practices, right? So one of the components of thinking about disability justice is thinking about the different ways in which students learn and the different ways faculty teach um, and approaching uh, inclusion through uh, the possibility of multiple learning modalities and different materials and having literal and figurative spaces for supporting those learning modalities. Yeah, so you, I mean, uh, alluded to the Universal Design for Learning framework, right, um, which in shorthand is UDL, but it's a great tool that we, oh, I started teaching uh, librarians who teach, which is basically in the reference and instruction department, uh, more about UDL so we can start moving towards that realm, which um, basically allows for flexibility in your teaching um, and multiple modalities. So basically you provide uh, instruction in multiple modalities, whether you allow students to read something or to listen to an audio like podcast or to watch a video or they can do all three, it's their choice. Um, and that way students can learn how they think it would be best for them. They have that choice, those options. And it's all about choice and flexibility. And so that's something we're definitely doing at, at uh, at Hannon, um, we're trying to, it's part of my job as in, the instructional designer to teach best practices. And that's something we've, we've started to integrate. Um, so if you notice like the tutorials that I produce, um, they come in different modalities where one is the tutorial in a certain software. Um, and then the other is a Word document, right? Which, and I'm still working to put more modalities in. A better way would be maybe to add, um, an audio component to it. Or for example, our videos, they are video instruction, but they also come with transcripts and closed captioning. So students can choose which way they bring that in. Sue, so do you wanna speak to also, I know that you've been a huge proponent of multiple modalities in your teaching. Do you want to speak to maybe some of the ways you're thinking yes, about this? I will. And also for the visually impaired, I'm a white person <laughs> um, sitting in my office with books behind me wearing a black shirt, I think. Black, yeah, black shirts um, and kind of white, blackish gray hair um, and glasses. Uh, I'm also autistic with ADHD and dyslexic. Um, and blind in one eye, so <laughs> I'm covering. I'm covering whoever I am here and where I'm speaking from. So yes, thank you um, uh, about the uh, and thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and be part of this panel. It's been great fun talking to people and getting getting prepared and thinking about all of these um, topics. Uh, so yeah, I think when I think about universal design for learning, I often, I think of that as a beginning point, but I like the fact that we've chosen the term inclusivity as the title and kind of our framework for it, because I think universal design for learning is the beginning in many ways. But when we talk about inclusivity and including in, in the sense of justice, like the great um, picture, which you know what, I've seen that picture over and over. And Amanda, because you explained it, I finally understood the visuals because I honestly never got the differences between the trees just because of the way I read things. And I'm like, oh, now I see what the difference is. I never got the leaning tree of anything. So thank you for that. It helps. And this is also multimodalities because I've only ever seen it shown. I've never had someone explain what I'm seeing. So I'm just using myself as an example because I've seen it, but I haven't seen it in the way it's intended to be, I haven't noticed because I'm thinking giving tree and I never got those fulcrums and stuff. Uh, so thank you very much. But, I, I, but I'm saying that because this is what I think we mean when we think about inclusivity and multiple means of access of always taking care because sometimes I think, especially in the classroom, we, whether we we know it or not, whether we're conscious of it or not, we have this kind of foundation of who we think our students are. And we tend to think our students are all abled mm -hmm. or unless they've gotten accommodations, which has helped them. And so we, we tend to teach to the abled, um, right? Even with, with all these multimodalities, um, 
uh, uh, papers. I mean, we so everybody writes a paper, everybody writes a seminar paper, people have participation grades, which seems to demand that everybody speaks in class. Um, and everybody raises their hands and speaker, we keep speaker lists and all of this. And I think, I think most of us are trained that way. That's how we were taught. And I think um, for those of us trying to work in this kind of way of inclusivity, where the idea is that if you create a classroom in which the disabled or people with disabilities can thrive, then everyone will thrive rather than making it able so that anyone who, who doesn't fit that understanding has to get an accommodation. Um, so that's why from the beginning with, and I think we're gonna talk more, so I don't wanna to talk too much so you can stop me at any point. Like I told my students today, interrupt me when I start babbling and throw a flag on the play. Uh, because I know we, we wanna have this conversation, but, but I think for me, that's, that's actually what it means starting with the syllabus and the way we prepare the first class is inviting everyone into this class in their fully embodied, embodied selves um, and then finding ways to make sure that it is that, that, that idea of inclusivity that no one is excluded and we create all of these things and we think things like what we say about technology in the classroom and, and what we say about participation and understanding that people process things at different rates and people, some people need to process a long time before they wanna speak and some people speak right away and probably should have processed a little longer, <laughs> we wish. Um, you know, and so we find different ways to allow students to show how they're engaged in the classroom with instead of the old whatever. And I'll stop there just because I could go on, but. but. <laughs> well, I like, thank you, Sue. I like that point that you bring up at the very end of what you were saying. Um, about things like how students process information, because it's not exactly something that we have like, you know, a blueprint for accommodating, right? Like, you know, in, in the sense that like, you know, maybe students just process at a, at a different rate than their peers. I mean, obviously everybody does, but we often don't think about that. And as I like speak very rapidly right now, I'm like also thinking about, oh, I, I wonder like if I'm speaking too fast for some people who are in this audience. I'm sure I am, and I'm sorry, um, but I am here to slow it down. But anyway, what I was gonna say is that it gets beyond just the accommodation model, which is like, you need one and a half times to take a test is different than like, you know, listening in class and then returning and reading something after or having a, like a visual model to accommodate that supports engagement in a different sort of temporal frame. Um, so that's one thing that, that I was thinking of. And the other thing that I wanted to actually ask Darlene um, was I was curious, like in instructional design, if there, if there is like a biggest concern that you encounter um, from faculty or like a really common sort of like question that you find yourself addressing in terms of instructional design um, for faculty and other librarians? Hmm. I don't know about that one. Um, common question. Sorry to spring it on you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I guess engagement is something everyone is worried about, you know, having active learning and how do we, in, you know, embed more active learning. And sometimes it gets mistaken for, especially with focusing on tutorials, people sometimes think just clicking a button is engagement, but it's not, <laughs> it's not active learning. You have to actually do something with it, maybe like a practice session, um, getting involved with the material and not just clicking next. Um, so I think that's what, what everybody struggles with most and then to bring the uh, point of accessibility and then how do you make it your active learning accessible for everybody you know and we always ask and when we're teaching workshops we have a, a little form that asks instructors if there's anybody with a disability in their class that's disclosed the disability um, but I still wonder about well what if they didn't disclose it you know uh, how do we in create engagement for everybody and just so, one way would be, you know, the different, just to have maybe different types of engagement and let them choose. But, you know, how do you make it one for everyone that's accessible? Mm -hmm. Well, also, you know, even that you, you point out just this like the button 
<laughs> right, the engagement through like clicking a button. Those types of types of technology in the classroom and over Zoom have been really huge. Like I know that as faculty, like using a poll um, during my Zoom session or using, you know, having folks fill out a Google um, form during the session has been great for just kind of like checking in and making sure we're engaged in some way. Um, I know we talked in our meeting about like other technologies mm -hmm. um, that maybe work as like, um, what's the language we use? Like it, they offer some sort of flexibility, um, might equalize access in certain ways. But I wonder, Darlene, if you and Marie want to talk a little bit about some of those um, mechanisms of access. Um, that the library uh, is sort of promoting or um, providing? For in, uh, instruction or just? In yeah, for, yeah, just like the technological um, accessibility that is sort of like part of uh, what the library is using in terms of technology to increase inclusivity and accessibility. Um, Within the physical library, I know that we have um, at the circulation desk, like students can check out different types of technology. So let's say with our computers, they're Mac computers. So if they don't like that mouse, they can check out a different type of mouse or a different type of keyboard. Um, some of our equipment in the information commons, which is on the first floor of the library, um, has you know specific screen readers. Although all Macs have voiceover, which allows for screen reading. Um, let's see, what other technology, Marie? Uh, I'm thinking about our laptop checkout too that uh, we yeah. instituted a few years ago um, that has been wildly successful from a, a justice perspective. Just the number of laptops that get checked out for short-term use is incredible. Yes. Our rooms, our instructional rooms have mic microphones so that the instructors can always use that to enhance their your speaking voice. Um, we luckily with Zoom, you get to record it. So that's uh, a big step in, in how you know people think or engage. We can always record the session, send it out, and then students can view it again if they need to. Maybe we were talking too fast. And that's one thing about um, our instruction is it's usually a one-off session, you know, a workshop that's an hour and that's all we get. So we have to um, provide as much information as we can, but also we have various methods that students can uh, engage with us, engage with the librarians. So we have sessions at the information desk where, you know, we have shifts there. So I have a shift at, at the information desk and if students wanted to come up and ask a question, a research question, they could, and that's just a walk up. But we also have research consultations and that's through appointments. So if students want to more in depth and one-on-one -on -one, consultation, we can do that. And that's either in person, over Zoom, on the phone. Um, it's very flexible. We have uh, chat as well. So that's on the front page of the library. And again, I have the shifts on chat as well. So sometimes people think that it's a, a, a bot, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, real life LMU librarians monitor the chat and it's 24 seven, which is extremely flexible. So students can go on there and talk to us and ask us questions. Um, and not just, you know, where to find a book, but maybe help them develop a, a topic, a research topic. Oh, can I ask yes. a question then from the library? Because it comes back to Amanda, the question you brought up at the beginning is, what have we learned in the pandemic um, as we've gone online and have developed different approaches um, to teaching and um, you know, I mean, there's a huge conversation. I don't know if you're following it right now, but there, there are student protests at the UCs, especially students with disabilities who do not want to go back in person. Mm -hmm. um, and so students with disabilities have been protesting at UCLA and the other UCs that have gone back in person now that the quarter's starting because they feel that being online with what, what, what we have, Zoom, chat, you know, all of these other means that make it more comfortable and not having to get to campus and get across campus and access buildings have, have been um, much more useful to um, students and faculty and staff with disabilities. So th they're not the only ones, but they tend to be big group of that. Um, so, and, and speaking of that, because there's also in this conversation among many um, faculty across like 
academic Twitter and social media about what we can keep from Zoom and chat because the chat function, the kind of what you were just talking about, darling, with the, with the actual chat provides people who feel more comfortable writing than speaking in class and in meetings, you know, many of us, I mean, we see this now that a lot of us feel like, no, I don't feel comfortable speaking up or I'm still processing, but I want to put something in the chat and also includes more voices. So we know how some of us dominate the conversations. So just speaking of that from just what we're learning pedagogically, and there's been a big discussion of how we can include the chat still in our in-person classes, like how, what kind of technologies are possible for that. So I'm wondering if, and, and what you've already said, what have, what, has the, what have you and the librarians learned from going online? Because you were so successful in going online, I think so quickly, and I know have really helped us, especially Rhonda, in film and TV studies, where we've had to come up with ways to stream material when we can't project things and make things available to us. It, what have you learned that it, that change with the pandemic that you are then going to continue to kind of bring into the library because uh, I, because I think many of these things have become to to help the library library sorry continue to fulfill its amazing function on campus while being totally closed down for so long and online does that make sense so. Uh, yeah, you know what, like you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned that we, you were surprised at how quickly we, we adjusted to the online environment. And that's because we were doing a lot of these things even beforehand, um, especially with my position. I was already, I had already created a lot of instructional videos. I had already created a lot of um, instructional tutorials. We already had that in place, especially in a first year seminar. So we right. just we what the, the one class we did um, online I mean in person at the time was rhetorical arts and so we found a way to just flip it to online and I think I helped with creating a couple of instructional videos and we put that in um, and we kind of did a, a flipped instruction so sometimes it's asynchronous for our 60 minute classes where students view um, uh, videos instructional videos online first and maybe do it for homework they play the radar challenge game that teaches them how, how to evaluate um, sources. And then they come in class and we talk about it. We um, talk about you know, what they thought about radar, um, uh, give them more resources, show them how to go over a database. But um, so a lot of that was very easy for us to just do. Um, but the one thing that we definitely kept was teaching online. Sue, so do you do FYS or rhetorical arts? I forgot. I'm sorry, what? Um, I, did, I, I thought you did FYS for rhetorical arts. Do you teach? No, right? I or somebody teach, else. I teach first year seminars. First year. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, w this year for rhetorical arts, we gave everybody the option, the instructors, do you want it in person or do you want it online? So that's something new. Um, and especially, I mean, we're still in this pandemic, right? So it's definitely needed because we don't know where it's going. But we like teaching online as well. So we hope to keep that even after this is over. I mean, if there's a lot of benefits, we can record it, students can see it later if they were absent. Um, and like you said, it provides different ways of engagement. And also probably educating faculty about what's available Right, I mean, which is what this is about, I think, in some way, because because I think, other than rhetorical arts, I think a lot of faculty aren't aware of what the what the libraries can offer in terms of multimodalities. Mm -hmm. True, I mean, and right. I forget. I think we have that in our in our form, instructional request form, of whether they want it online or in person. Yeah, but whether or not we yeah. faculty actually use it, when we're so busy doing everything <laughs> yeah. else, you know, um, request instruction. <laughs> If we're, we're sure we get the information somewhere, but it's like reminding us that it's available and how to use it because, uh, which I think is part of why we're doing this today. Right? Yeah. You know, and I like often, I said, sorry, we're, and like no, I said, we're, develop, we're developing a lot of uh, asynchronous instruction too with tutorials, so that's also available. Um, I was just going to say, I appreciate the conversation about, um, well, A, that, about the students protesting, Sue, so, um, and also, and, and like what 
what remote learning has done to increase um, access for so many people, including folks who are disabled and chronically ill. Um, that's been super huge and can't we can't understate that. But also in this very same conversation, we can see like the limit of so-called universal design. Because like there, you know, so Amy Mrahi um, has this beautiful paper about um, universal design as a feminist pedagogy. And in it, um, Amy writes that uh, universal design is a horizon, right? Like we can never actually, actually achieve universal design because a lot of our access needs can be at odds with one another. So for example, I know a lot of folks um, on the autism spectrum don't actually do very well on Zoom, right? It's very overwhelming. It's a lot of information, sensory information happening. Um, you know, simultaneously. And for some folks and the ways that they learn, they prefer to be in person, right? And sort of be able to um, experience the learning space in that particular way. And so, um, and so, yeah, like how do we think about teaching and how do we think about instruction um, in, in a way that resists this like, this one size, not one size fits all, but this like, if we can just dial it in, right? If we can just like hit all the accessibility points, then we'll like achieve universal design and everyone will have equal access and an equitable experience, right? To so recognizing um, that there's always gonna be these gaps that emerge. Yeah, that's a good point because I'm in several groups of um, autistic people and having this conversation and one of the conversations has been, how have you been successful as an autistic person in higher ed, these are all, you know, um, faculty and students in higher ed having this conversation. And just Amanda, what you're saying is that on one hand, it's been nice because we can be at home, we can be comfortable if we need to turn off our camera, if we need to stim a little bit, you know, all of the things that sometimes we have to do and we can control lights and all of that, it's been good. But on the other hand, because we have trouble reading facial expressions, it's really hard on the small screen. Although on the other hand, it's also impossible with masks. So we're kind of like doomed either way. And where do you look, you know, at your camera or whatever. And to, for me also, it's very noisy because the chat is so noisy. And I, I hear the chat as if I'm hearing real voices. So for me and other autistic people who are hypersensitive to noise and stimulation, there is the Zoom, and then the chat, and it's like all these voices coming at you all at once, right? So, so to that point, I think, and, and it happens in a lot of these, you know, yeah, so you're right. So how do you manage it? You know? And that's something that's been difficult, I think, for a lot of people. I mean, especially for us who are teaching, right? We're trying to keep track of the chat, but we're also trying to look at the screens to see if anybody has a hand raised, and it's a lot for us as well. Um, and we're hoping that one way we're helping students, you know, try to quiet everything down is by also having all of our information available in our libguides. So on our website, we have our PowerPoints, we have the videos that we show, you know, we have the agenda and it goes through the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that that happened when the pandemic started and we all moved to work from home was that all of the DVDs that were housed behind the check-in desk at the library needed to suddenly be switched to um, online access, to streaming access. And so we did that, Rhonda and I didn't sleep for several days just trying to, to generate streaming access links and it was fine, we were willing to do it. But it did cross my mind that streaming access implies a stable internet connection. And so does a lot of Zoom class classes. Um, and when the pandemic started, I mean, for every meeting, somebody dropped off or somebody froze. And so that that's something that I think about as we're moving forward it, as, as a justice issue. Like at what point are we gonna talk about internet as um, required at that point? So even within all of the design that that horizon that Amanda mentioned, I think is still, it's still out there. We're getting closer to it, but there's still like some fundamental issues 
that need to be resolved at some point. I, we're not going to resolve that today, but even calling attention to them, I think, is is yeah. good. We're going to stay here until we figure it out, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to. <laughs> we and have until if, six. <laughs> if, in fact, I, I, I first learned about that when we, when we went online so quickly, whenever, mm -hmm. 100 years ago, whatever that was. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I shouldn't, I mean, here I am, all inclusivity and justice and all of this, but I was astonished to learn how many of my students did not have access. They, they relied on the, on the li library. And when the library closed, they were really, you know, and, and, and it's not that the library was closed. They had gone home for spring break and couldn't come back to campus. And so therefore their access to laptops and computers they did not have because they totally depended on the library and and it was eye-opening to me because it was it was not just one or two students it was quite a few students and and both economic access like you're saying but also to remember how many of our students you know it, again it's that assumption that all of our students have all of these things you know, like all of our students, like none of our students are working jobs and all of these things that we have to constantly remind ourselves of. So I was glad you mentioned that with earlier on is these laptops because I thought, oh my gosh, I need to remember this because, you know, um, uh, and I have, I have extra laptops I keep here like Chromebooks that I lend out to students when their computer laptops break and they don't have, but I wasn't here either. We were none of us on, yeah. on campus. And so, and they couldn't use our cell phones because of data. I mean, all of these things that, um, you know, that, that, and I think that's comes back to that question, Amanda, you raised it, is it's not just access because of abilities and discipline, it's economic. It's all of these other things that come into play that, that I think many of us were not really, really thinking about our students until we saw it. Oh my gosh, this is really, you know, uh, and how do we continue to address that and not just assume, oh, everybody's back on pers in person, so everybody, so all, so it's all okay now. Everybody has the economics they need or access to everything. Yeah, and thinking about access in that like capacious way, right? As, as not just talking about specific individual accommodations, but thinking about things like economic access, having, you know, a stable, quiet environment with a stable internet <laughs> that you can do yeah. for your class. Like this is all sort of the disability justice way of thinking about access, right? Thinking about how access is enabled by these different structural um, mechanisms. Uh, and also I, I just dropped a link in the chat to this wonderful blog post by Mia Mingus, who is a disability justice activist and a transformative justice and abolitionist um, advocate. And in this blog post, she writes about, it's called Access Intimacy, but she's writing about um, uh, interdependency, but which is the fact that we all are constantly, none of us is really independent, but we're, we all rely on one another and lots and lots of people in various ways. But the other really important intervention that she makes is that access is, is actually a fluid and ongoing thing. Like we have to be revising access. We have to be in communication with one another. We have to consider how access needs shift in time and place, right? And in some situations, some folks access needs are really, really great. And in other situations, they're not as great, right? And so that involves us talking with one another all the time. And it involves like trying to sort of like elevate this whole conversation and, and bring it into the public sphere and exactly what you're saying, Marie and Sue right now, which is like getting folks to even think about what are the obstacles, you know, what are the things that we're not imagining? How do we start to imagine them, right? Because um, we can't negotiate it and we can't be flexible about it if we're not even talking about it. And we often aren't talking about it. We're often sort of just operating under assumptions. Um, but also in terms of accessibility, <laughs> Marie, you started to tell us about that shift to streaming, which also I like personally owe Rhonda just like unending gratitude for how many last minute emails 
I was like, can you please help me get this film streaming immediately? I know Rhonda is like literally a hero. Um, but I was wondering, I know there's a lot of other structural accessibility, um, structural access points, the, 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 or it's, you know, what I'm, I've lost, I've lost my words. I know that accessibility is built into the library structurally in many different ways. And I wonder if you would like to tell us about some of these things. Sure. So my role in the library is to manage all of the licensed electronic collections. Mm. So all of the ebooks, e-journals, databases, streaming videos, they run through our small but mighty unit. Um, and before we even add any content to the collection, I negotiate with the vendor that's selling that content, um, a written document called a license agreement. And these are usually five to 10 pages long. And what they do is record kind of our shared understanding about how a database, for example, is going to be used in our library. And so a library, some might, or a license agreement is filled with tiny but important details. It defines stuff like, for example, who is an authorized user. And so when I approach a license agreement, I like, I like to think of the aspects with like the, the broadest interpretation of what an authorized user is. So that anyone formally affiliated with LMU obviously gets access, but also that anyone that walks into the library can use it. So our local community of users is important to us. Mm -hmm. And so when we negotiate, we wanna make sure that we're thinking of all possible audiences for the things that we buy. So there's, there's one thing that I've negotiated in license agreements uh, with a 100% acceptance rate. So that means for every time I've requested it be added to a license, it's been accepted. So here, here's the language, I'll read it to you. It's a, a clause titled accessibility. And it says, licensor shall comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, sections 504 and 508 of the Rehabilitation Act and other applicable laws to make products accessible by all users, such as by supporting assistive software or devices such as large print interfaces, text to speech output, voice activated input, refreshable braille displays, and alternate, alternate keyboard or pointer interfaces, interfaces in a manner consistent with the web content accessibility guidelines 2.1. So I'll paste into the chat a couple of links um, you can check out if you wanna learn more about this, these web content accessibility guidelines. Um, the group that puts these guidelines together is headed by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. So I think we're in good hands from an accessibility standpoint. And I guess the good news about license agreements is that I rarely anymore have to request the addition of this accessibility clause. Um, it's now usually almost there, but that is due to years <laughs> of vendors having librarians across the world requesting it. Um, so the, the work I just described of advocating for our library patrons before we even buy anything. It's a single action. It's me, just one person communicating directly with the vendor. And I think that communication is much more effective when it's done as part of a collective action, like what we're about here today. So I'll tell you a, a brief advocacy story to reinforce that. Okay. So LMU is an active partner in a regional licensing consortium called Skelk. And Skelk's core business is negotiating contracts on a large scale. So libraries can choose to buy electronic content through Skelk and they'll do the negotiating for you. So LMU gets a lot of stuff from Skelk because they're really good at their jobs. Um, they also have over 300 member and affiliate libraries. So you can imagine that a consortium of that scale, when they uh, negotiate with the vendor, they have much better success than just like one person doing their work. But there was an area 
that I thought Skelk could improve on. And so in 2014, I petitioned the consortium to add a step when they negotiate new contracts on behalf of those 300 libraries, and they agreed to it. I totally celebrated. What they agreed to was that they would begin asking vendors for what's called a voluntary product accessibility template or a VPAT. So in completing a VPAT, a vendor reviews their own product and they check off, it's a, like a list of accessibility criteria to say whether their product supports or does not support things like the use of a screen reader or keyboard options for making selections rather than needing to use a mouse. So in this way, individual Skelk library members could be assured that the e-resources that they licensed through Skelk are guaranteed some level of accessibility. So Skelk has agreed to post these VPATs along with their license agreements in a password protected web space. So as a result of this simple act of advocacy, this action by Skelk benefits the over 300 institutions that license e-resources through them. And for fun, I pulled up a VPAT. I'm going to share my screen with you and show you what that looks like. It is a Microsoft Word document. These are horrible. They're 26 pages long. This one is. This is just the incomplete template. The first 14 pages are preamble for <laughs> what a vendor even needs to think about before they assess their own product. And they will go through using the guidelines and complete this. And it's, it's a voluntary thing, um, but I think it's important that we are, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, I think it's important that we ask for these kinds of things that libraries generally make this known that this is an important thing. And these are fairly common now, which is good news. Um, and I guess one more thing while, while my mic is turned on, I'll tell you about um, is in addition to how resources are accessed, we're thinking about what resources we provide access to. So in 2017, I and a group of library staff were awarded an Inclusive Excellence Project Grant um, from LMU's University Intercultural Council. And our project was titled Assessing the Diversity of the E Collection of the William H. Hannon Library. So the assessment was to determine if the library's online databases, which we know are most often the first point of research consultation for our students and faculty, we wanted to see if they were adequately bridging disciplines and representing diverse topics and perspectives. So we worked with a group of students to do this project and we performed a series of keyword searches within six categories of concern um, to see how well those categories were represented in our database collection. So let me share my screen with you one more time. I wanna show you the result of that. Okay. So there were three categories of the six where there was what we considered minimal representation in our databases. And those top minimal ones were disability, only uh, on this pie chart, 1.67% of all of the keyword search results had something to do with disability research. Um, second was women's studies, second smallest category, that was 3.43. And then, the third smallest at 4.55% was gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. And so we took this as an opportunity to think about, well, now that we know this information, what are we gonna do about it? 
And so it was a real fun opportunity to begin to add content to our collection that address these things. And I wanna show you real quick, I'm just gonna scoot over to our library page. I'm gonna to go to our database list to show you a resource that we just added. So I started at the main library page. I clicked on the databases link and up at the top, there's this link where you can browse new resources. I'm gonna click through to that. And this new resources, it's just, just the things that we've bought in the last three months. And this one we just got called Disability in the Modern World. Um, it's a nice mix of content. And it's a mix of video, some monographic content. I'm gonna click through to one of these um, videos that's in here just to show you the kinds of things that we think about when we think about accessibility. So this is a music video is what's on the screen now. If I move my mouse, I'm gonna click up at the top, there's a link called transcript. And that transcript is running along with the music video, the lyrics that are being sung on the screen. And you can see at the bottom, there's captions that can either be turned on or off. So I just wanted to highlight this as like the kind of content that we're buying and the ways that we're thinking about, um, like what you talked about earlier about different mod modalities for teaching. I think this is really neat to have the transcripts, transcripts running alongside next to something like a video. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And yeah. I'll pass, pass the mic back to you. Well, to sort of add to that, because you know, we, we you showed the assessment that we did for the collections we have, but we yeah. also assessed the library in its physical aspects, digital aspects. Um, yeah. Well, let me just to talk about the accessibility task force that we formed back in 2019, I believe it was. Um, and it went into the end of 2020, which overlapped with the pandemic, but we were still able to uh, evaluate most of the library in terms of how accessible it was. So we did go through the physical environment using uh, resources like the ADA checklist for existing facilities. And we went through and you know, measured everything <laughs> just to make sure we were accessible with like the width of the aisles, uh, the height of the counters, things like that. Um, we also went through and gave a survey to staff just to see about what training or awareness they had uh, you know dealing of, of uh with people with disabilities or um, different types of disabilities and how you provide customer service um we also went through and analyzed our digital aspects so the the website the libguides um and that was with wcag 2.0 standards that we looked at and of course our instruction so all of that we ended up putting in a report and um, we ha basically handed it off to our new committee, which is the DEIA committee, who's going to take over um, and, and hopefully uh, implement some of these changes. Yeah, and we were a little delayed because of the pandemic, but now that we're back in person, we can get back to that. Can I, can I share just one more thing? It's a, such a cool collection. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. So our library has Tony Coelho's papers. Um, Tony Coelho is the primary author and sponsor of the American Disabilities Act. His papers are in our library right now. Um, there's, I'll, I'll pop this link in the chat when I'm done sharing my screen to give you a sense of what's in that collection that's being processed, but this is accessible. You can, uh, well, right now, because we're still under some COVID restrictions, faculty, LME faculty and staff can schedule uh, time to go in and look at this content, but okay, I've stopped sharing, thanks. 
I love it. I'm so excited about the collections. I'm so excited about the new collection. It's so um, rad, right? There's yeah, such I, good stuff out here. Yeah, it's great. And I, I I shouldn't have clicked the link because it's a little distracting. I just want to look through it. But um, and also some who wrote in the chat. Uh, I think Rhonda wrote in the chat, like this is such a great story about behind the scenes advocacy, right? Like we don't, this is quiet ongoing advocacy that's making like really substantive structural changes. And just thanks for sharing, Marie, that's so good. Um, I want us to be able to have a little time for conversation if anybody has questions, but before, but I also want to think about next direction type questions. Um, so one of the things that I guess broadly, I guess broadly, my question is like, what are next steps? Like what are future project ideas, future collaboration possibilities um, or other access points that the library is thinking about that are coming down the pike that are on the agenda? Um, and I will just sort of gesture, we, we, let's talk about this really broadly and let's talk about all the things. And I'll also just kind of gesture to a question in the chat um, about how libraries and perhaps our library specifically deals with quote unquote invisible disabilities um, and then lists here uh, a number of uh, chemical sensitivity and sensory sensitivity type disabilities um, and how these can be barriers to access. So open it up broadly, what's next? And then how do we also think about invisible disabilities? I can not say that um, when I was trying the uh, accessibility task force, one of the next steps that we wanted to do was to definitely talk to our users, you know, especially those with disabilities or invisible disabilities to see how we can better improve. Um, and with something like asthma and allergens, I don't know if we, I don't know what we currently have in place, but I know for another um, invisible disability like uh, diabetes, we do allow eating and drinking in the library. And that's some, something that most libraries don't allow, but we do. Um, and so it's little, little things like that, that if, if people let us know and how we can help and how we can work together to, to improve their experience in the library. We would love to do that. So I showed you that uh, that little video with the transcript running next to it on purpose, um, because one of one of my roles um, in dealing with vendors is that it's my job to go back to vendors and say, hey, we've seen this video running with the transcript right next to it on this platform. Can you do this on your platform? So think of us as a partner with uh, the materials that you use in your classroom. For example, if it's important to you that your videos have closed caption, um, let us know. And we're happy to advocate for that kind of stuff. So like I said, it, even negotiating a license agreement that it took years to stop seeing, for me to stop having to ask for that accessibility clause to be added. If enough people are asking for these kinds of things, we're reliant on vendors for this content. So we just need to make sure that our voice is consistently heard. So if you see that your students are not able to use library materials in the way that they want to, or in the way that supports them best, we absolutely want to know about that. So we're not shy about communicating with vendors what our needs are. I think, I think there's an additional awareness component too for, for maybe a lot of faculty, which is that a lot of folks don't even know what they could be asking for, right? So, I mean, I know in my experience, I always use captions when I show films and I every class that I or you know music videos or whatever in every class that I do I'll have students say like you know obviously I don't have an auditory impairment but like just having the captions on was so great <laughs> right they don't even realize that it that it could be there and it could just be built in 
to everything that we're doing all the time. And so um, in my FLC, which, uh, which uh, Sue and Darlene are both a part of, we, we've been thinking about this question actually lately, like what are even the questions that we don't know to ask, right? And I guess this also speaks to um, Elena, did I say that right? Oh, Ayana's a comment in the chat, right? Like having people with disabilities, having librarians with disabilities, um, and having folks with disabilities on faculty and on staff and being part of that like decision making and shaping process is really essential. Um, other ideas, Sue, do you want to chime in on the topic of next steps? Well, I, you know, this question of um, capturing or those of us in film using subtitles, um, which is 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 very interesting because those of us who teach film TV studies, I mean, of course, that's all we're doing is showing. So for using uh, Blu-ray or DVD, we can provide the subtitles with it, which over the years, and I'm trying to get better. Sometimes I forget because I'm just so quickly pulling stuff up. Is also not is also helpful to our international students. I mean, it's really helpful to students for whom English is not their first language. You see what I mean? So, so it's what we start. If we create something that is inclusive for people with disabilities, it ends up. It's like this story, you know, of uh, uh, sidewalk ramps. You know, originally for wheelchairs, but they become very useful for everybody. You know, strollers and all that. Um, but what's but it raises a question, which I can bring back to my faculty, is because we actually do show film prints and DCPs in our theater in all of our film classes and those are not they're not always provided with subtitles because they're released for theatrical release which has different levels of accessibility so I mean I'm just thinking of you know these things that we don't think about along with the invisible disabilities which um, and I know Amanda you have probably also been to conferences around disability studies and the first time I went to one I was amazed because I had a thought, but the rule was no perfume, no anything, and you couldn't, and styrofoam cups, which are very, uh, you know, I can't handle them. They're very noisy. And, you, and so I love going to those conferences because the rules are already right in place or conferences for neurodivergent people or whatever. So I, I, I think that, I mean, just making accessibility known to faculty, you know, on how to use a library and uh, is one thing, but I think also helping to educate people about the, so the invisible ones, especially perfumes and, you know, for, and not just for allergies, but for people who are highly sensitive to stimulation from light, sounds, and smells, you know, right, that can be very off-putting, you know, if I'm in a meeting in person and there's, I can't even focus anymore. So that's not an answer. That's just like, yes, we need to do a better job with all of this stuff. As we say that horizon is sometimes close and sometimes very far away as we start looking at that horizon of accessibility. But I, I just, I, I think I think what we've talked about is to letting, I mean, getting the word out for faculty to, to say, look, here's what the library has which also gets faculty thinking about, oh my gosh, how am I treat, how am I approaching accessibility in my classroom? Does that make sense? I mean, it works both ways. So, I mean, I know we get those William H. Hannon newsletters all the time. <laughs> we read, do we all read them? Oh, you know. <laughs> I read them. I know we do, but <laughs> sorry. We all read the newsletter. We all read everything all the time that comes into our email boxes. Um, so in our remaining time, yes, if anybody has any questions, suggestions, wants to chime in, I have a question um, and genuinely like want to understand something a little bit better, um, which is I am a huge advocate for open access um scholarship and i'm wondering you know for economic accessibility and also like knowledge should be free um but i'm wondering if um marie kind of like what you were explaining about skilk and that whole process um like how that overlaps with with um 
ask how the library acquires and uses open access materials or like where those limits are and how those overlap if they're different conversations genuinely just kind of wondering yeah. so i have a lot of uh opinions about open access content that's provided by a publisher or a vendor because open is not their business goal and so when i see things like i'm just going to pop into the chat a project that the library champions called the open and affordable textbook initiative um, this is something that's supported by the office of the provost the lmu bookstore the academic technology committee and the center for teaching excellence um, i'm much more interested in seeing the library champion things that are generated by the population that's going to use them um, because I know what our I know what the LMU mission is, and it's different than open access that, that's provided by by a vendor. So I, I'm really pleased to see that this kind of initiative has it caught fire at LMU. Um, there's even a grant. Hold on, let me see if I can grab a. Yes. Hold on. I'm going to paste one more link in the chat for. Um, an open and affordable textbook initiative in ODI grant. The deadline is at the end of this month so that there's still time. Um, if you're an LMU faculty member interested in committing to collaborative, collaboratively identifying and creating open educational resources, there's grant funds to support that happening on our campus. So I'll, I'm going to step off my soapbox about OA now at this point. <laughs> can you, I mean, if you don't mind, what can you explain what you mean um, about like the vendors open, like the vendors agenda with open access versus the library's mission? Because I don't know what you're talking about. That is a fair question. So a vendor or a publisher's end goal is to make money and they're gonna figure out how they can do that. And sometimes a vendor will have a journal where, uh, uh, let's say you're a journal um, article author, you're gonna submit to a journal. That journal can make your open access, they can make your article free to read worldwide if you just pay them an article processing fee. The most egregious fee that we've seen recently is in Nature, and it was like $11,000 or something like that to publish your article open access. But then a library still pays that publisher to subscribe to that content. So in essence, higher ed has paid them twice. And so, so that, that's my concern about the money generation behind it. Whereas something like uh, what's happening on LMU's campus, it's not fund free. It's just a different prioritization of what that funds are going toward. Gotcha. Um, Darlene, do you want to add? I feel like you're nodding so emphatically. <laughs> Sorry, I always do that. <laughs> um, I did want to add a little bit about open access, not to be um, Debbie Downer, but we also have a, a discussion um, on on you know disability forums about how open access isn't always open for everybody, even if it's available for for free. Um, if the basics aren't implemented, you know, when the creators forming the document, uh, if the basics of like headings, alt text, um, color contrast, you know, the formatting, if that's not there, then it can't be accessible to people who use screen readers or to people who have color blindness or dyslexia, things like that. So we do have to keep that in mind. And just my little quick plug, if you wanna start 
you know, anybody that creates content, it's your responsibility to make it accessible. So if you want to start, open up a Word document, maybe you already have something written, click the review tab, and there's a button that says check accessibility. So it's just like a quick way to check, you know, obviously it's done by machine, so it's not perfect, but it's a start. Okay, so the lesson that I'm hearing here is that open access on paper sounds like open access, but behind the scenes, there's quite a bit more going on, including that it's not actually truly economically accessible and that it's not always even accessible in terms of ADA compliance. And so we are all incredibly grateful that we have library detectives here to help us sort through this. Um, thank you both for explaining that to me. Um, a question in the chat. Oh, this is a good question. I think I know the answer to, but does academia now accept open access articles as they do journal publication re promotion or tenure? In my experience, it depends on the department and the university. Sue, you're still muted. I know, I will say this, but I'm still muted, which uh, because all of our departments are currently working on revising our department standards around you know, diversity, um, inclusivity, and equity. So I, I don't, uh, like Amanda says, it depends department to department, but I know our department is, you know, we're very much incorporating and, and engaging open access. And I, I I don't know, Amanda, do you think it will become more widespread, especially as it starts appearing in different standards? Um, I mean, I hope across the university, um, especially those of us working in humanities, I think, but. Um. I mean, I don't know. I, I can speak just sort of anecdotally that when I got my book contract, um, University of Michigan Press has a, um, a grant to publish half of their um, monographs, open access. And in disability studies is something that we, you know, think a lot about. Um, I know that Duke is also publishing uh, a greater number of titles in their disability series, open access. Um, but when I went to sort of like ask folks about the process, uh, I, I was met with a lot of skepticism. Like, oh yeah, like, are you sure? Oh, really? um, is this, you know, are you sure you want to do open access? I'm not sure what the benefit is. Um, there might be drawbacks. So, yeah, it's it's true. And and some open access require you, the author, to pay money, right? I mean, the the last one I was asked for that for a chapter in a book, and they go, if you want to do open access, you'll have to give us this much money, or you can go not, and you don't give it which is weird because we actually don't make any money off of, you know, we get a copy of the book. So um, I think that comes to um, uh, what, what um, you know, you all were saying about um, these, you know, I mean, these economic questions as well is that scholars are also becoming this bind, right? I mean, in terms of, we, many of us support open access because that's what we believe that knowledge should be accessible and, and free. But then when you find out, oh, oh, I have to pay all of this money to the publisher who will then make money, but I'm not gonna make any money as a scholar because what I'll get is two, volume, two, two copies of the book or whatever. Um, it, it comes to that same thing you're talking about in terms of these journals and what Glenn was putting in the chat about like nature making all of this money in, in two ways from everything. So, um, yeah, anyway. Hey, um, I, Darlene, Marie, Sue, thank you for your knowledge and your advocacy. Um, does anybody want to add, tie a bow on it, add some final thoughts? Are there any final questions? Thank you to everybody who's participated in the chat. Um, I love how this question about open access really fired people up. <laughs> it's so contentious. And yes, thank you for the TikTok doctor link. Um, but yeah, if there's no further questions, we can go ahead and I'll turn it back over to Rhonda. Well, I just wanna say that I love this conversation. 
I was so excited to put on this program with Nicole Murph. And I think it went so way beyond our expectations. You guys were just great. And thank you so much for giving us so much to think about and to really expand our knowledge base on just what the word disability means. I mean, I, I've learned so much about this. Um, so I have a deep appreciation and thank you to all of our panelists, Darlene Aguilar, Marie Kennedy, Susan Scheibler, and of course, to our wonderful moderator who did all the heavy lifting, Amanda Apgar, um, and for guiding this wonderful discussion. I would also just like to thank the infrastructure of the CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice and um, who gave us this opportunity. And special thanks to our technology guru, Stephanie Mejia. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you very much. Keep an eye out for the rest of the programs uh, for the CSJ Symposium and um, have a very safe and wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody. One, there's one question in chat. Oh, from, from Kylie. Kylie. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, where do you, I don't see. Unless they've gone away, unless they left, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, well, I don't see it. So if you see it, let me know. But um, anybody? Nope. Okay. What do you think? It might have been an accidental hand raise, <laughs> but okay. maybe it was Kylie just like, good job giving us high five. <laughs> I'm sure In it which was. Case, thank you, Kylie. And <laughs> thank you, everybody. High five. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone.